Well, good afternoon and um, happy Sabbath. We're going to continue our study on uh, righteousness by faith, and we're going to be reading some material from Jones again. We're going to continue that. But first, I want to look at something that uh, was brought up at the end of this morning's meeting, and um, which I think is quite significant. It doesn't directly relate to things. It's sort of a and the juncture to what we've been studying is regarding 1888. Um, so what you see in front of you is uh, some dates. You see November 9th, 1849, October 22, 1924, uh, August 6, 1945, and July 18, uh, 2020. Theodore? So, yep. Yeah. Before we start this, should we need we a word of prayer? Yes. Yes, I forgot. <laughs> yeah, I knew there was something I wasn't doing. So let's begin with a word of prayer. Uh, dear Father in heaven, we are so very grateful for the Sabbath. And uh, we thank you, Lord, for all the things you teach us. And we just invite your spirit's presence as we look at these dates, as we look at this message. We need your Holy Spirit to teach us and guide us. And um, we are very thankful uh, for the time that we have to study together. We know that the messages that we have been hearing are convicting. They show our need of you and our dependence upon you in all things. And it makes our hearts heavy because we know that um, um, so much of the work that you have sought to do in us has not been accomplished. And so we just ask that you can continue to do this work that you have begun, that you complete it unto the day of Jesus Christ. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> okay, sorry about that. Sometimes get overly excited about things, uh, especially numbers. Uh, so what we see in front of us are these four dates, November 9th, 1849, October 22, 1924. And of course, we would recognize that that date is... Um, uh, I think it's 98 years ago, right? So uh, that's two uh, Jubilee cycles ago. Uh, then we have August 6, 1945. The significance of that is Hiroshima and um, July 18, 2020. Now, the November 9th, 1849 date is 1844 days from October 22, 1844. And this date was one that Steve and Jameson back in 2018, in the summer of 2018, prior to hearing anything about uh, Tess's prediction of, of November 9th, uh, was one of the keys that helped him to see November 9th, 2019. So he saw this November 9th date, um, which, which we've done studies on before. Now, the interesting thing here is we have... Um, uh, these two numbers, the 34968. So that's, of course, a cardinal count. So if we count from November 9th, 1849 uh, to August 6th, 1945, and we count inclusively, it's 34,969 days. And 969 days, or 34,969 days is simply a a calculation of the square root of 187. So if I take 187 and I just square it, I get this number 34,969. Now, uh, this is gonna go to our studies of triangles. And uh, if we look here at these, this triangle, the one here in the center, notice the two adjacent sides to the right angle are 187 in length, and the hypotenuse is 264 with a decimal. So here we have a symbol of July 18th attached to another symbol, the 26th day of the fourth month. So what's the significance of using this triangle for this 187 uh, in the context of what I'm talking about? Well, 
not only does the long side give us the 26th day of the fourth month, yeah, but the three digits right after that give us 457. Yeah, so we get yeah, 457, etc. So so and that's that could be significant. But but the 264 itself, and I'm not trying to diminish that, we notice that two of these dates, that is the two end dates, August 6th, 1945 is the 26th day of the fourth month, as is July 18, 2020. So, so we have a very complex structure here. We have these symbolic dates, November 9th, October 22nd, August 6th, and July 18th, connected with these squares of 187 with two different spans. And that's why with the two different spans, I started thinking about the triangle that I have there with the two adjacent sides being 187 producing 264. Does that make sense to people? I mean, we can see this isn't just an accident. So, so we have this November 9th date. Now, nothing happens on that November 9th, 1849. It's simply a symbolic date. But what about the October 22, 1924 being um, the date that A.G. Daniels is given to write this book? It's called Christ Our Righteousness. And so this book, and you were telling us about it, uh, Dwight, before we started recording here. What was the significance of that book, Christ Our Righteousness by A.G. Daniels? Well, this is, this is a false righteousness by faith book. Mm -hmm. And the fact that A.G. Daniels, the only man that ever had, I believe it's a two-year term where he did not serve as president of the general conference he served as administrator and then was elected later as president okay and he served the longest time of any of the the presidents of the general conference he was one that had such a affinity for things that were being taught that were just not true. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was a, he was a longtime friend of W.W. W. Prescott. Yeah. And it was Prescott that five years before had stated he hoped never again to have to give a message on the 2300 days. So we have a book that's being published that is not factual in total. It's got some truth, mm -hmm. but it's also mixed with a lot of error. Right. And, and the main thing about the book is it's, it's used as an excuse um, for the idea that the church never rejected the 1888 message. Right. So Froome is going to use this as evidence that the, that it, the, the 1888 message was eventually accepted. It was only just an initial sort of uh, apprehension and accepting the message. But the but problem it understood. Right. The problem that we have with that premise. Had the message of righteousness by faith, even to this day been accepted by the church, then the earth would be lighted with the glory of God. Mm -hmm. The work would be complete. And what's going on right now would be <clears throat> necessary. Yes. And, and so we see that that didn't happen. Now, when we get to the 1893 uh, sermons, the General Conference Bulletin and Jones sermons here, 
and we read Ellen White's testimony, we can see that there is a beginning of an acceptance of the message. Now, I think part of the problem, and we're going to see this more as we go into reading um, uh, Wagner and some other things Jones wrote and um, getting into this history a little deeper, is that even if there was an intellectual understanding of some of the concepts by various people, there was not an experience, the accordant experience that should go along with that understanding. Because it, it's righteousness by faith is not really an intellectual. Me, please. Yeah, Mark. I, I did add up. I did, I, I did see the years mm -hmm. of this study. I did add it up every seven point. I did add things in the years of it, it be seven point seven. 38. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Welcome. Okay. <clears throat> so, so we know that righteousness by faith can, can be understood at least partially intellectually, but it's really an experience. That is, it produces a work of confession and repentance. And, and what we saw, um, in uh, the 1980s and 90s in regard to the understanding of righteousness by faith um, for those that were a part of that experience. Um, it was really a debate, an intellectual debate more than anything. And there were some people on the right side of the debate and some people on the wrong side. But did the, was the work accomplished that should have been accomplished by the understanding of that message, you know, a hundred years later. Absolutely not. No, we, we actually saw quite the contrary that on both sides of the issue, the spirits that were being manifest were very unchristlike. Uh, there was a great reproach brought to the understanding of righteousness by faith, by the various Debates that were going on and the personalities involved in how they acted. And we have seen that continue to this day. People profess to believe in righteousness by faith. They profess to accept the message of Jones and Wagner, but they continue to act contrary to Christ. That is, the message isn't really understood. So when Ellen White talks about the message being understood or the message being presented, there's some element of that message that seems to uh, evade us. And I, and I think Jones in his presentations is trying to bring that to us. And, and people are in a sense getting it. They're seeing their need of Christ, but there's something lacking. Now, my argument has always been what's lacking is the prophetic message that brings the power and the conviction that righteousness by faith can be acted out. That is, we can understand righteousness by faith and we can feel conviction to some degree, and we can confess our sins and repent. But the power of the gospel is a three-step testing prophetic message, correct? Exactly. And, it, and it's not just an experience, an emotional experience or something like that. It's actually becoming a part of prophecy. Excuse me, please. Yeah, Mark. And I heard from yourself saying strong word for that word be print. <coughs> um, I said how to Print that, careful. Uh, you, 
did say that a G word for print, how how you did say G word, you did say that that word say print. I said how to get that. This our God texted me last night. He asked me, "You have a print your sins to me. You don't have that. How to get that to make a print?" Okay. I ask him that the, that one. Well, I'm not sure I fully understand your question. And you did say that that was. Well, we need the power of God. What? We need the power of God, the gospel, the everlasting gospel, a three step testing prophetic message. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. But you just said that now. I, I said that now. How to get that? Well, it's part of prophecy. So we have to participate in the work that God is doing in a prophetic line. I now, don't uh, have that one. Yeah, okay. So everybody has is involved in a prophetic line, whether on a personal level. So the simple idea of a line is you have a period of darkness. You're in darkness. You need light. And the time of the end comes, it's a prophetic moment, it's a date that's marked. And <clears throat> with that time of the end comes an increase of light. And we, we have this light and we have to accept it. If we accept that light, we're going to go get more light and that other light is gonna bring us through another experience. In these, in these experiences, there are disappointments, there's the work of the enemies, all these things occur in a reform line. But ultimately, the end of a reform line is displaying Christ's character. That's the end of a reform line, because we demonstrate uh, Christ's character. It develops two classes of worshipers and also develops, uh, develops and demonstrates their character. So it develops these characters and demonstrates it. So what I'm saying is that with Jones... And, and the people in 1888 and afterwards, they're missing the prophetic element. There's, there's truth in the message that's being presented. It is the third angel's message. But it's, they're not going to be able uh, to accomplish the task. The prophetic message has been rejected. So we're going to continue reading uh, what Jones says here. So he says, then there are three more lines tonight, just as distinct as the three we had last night, which shut us up to the third angel's message as it reads. I will read a passage that belongs right with that one that we read last night. When God's people humble the soul before him, individually seeking his Holy Spirit with all the heart, there will be heard from human lips such a testimony as is represented in this scripture. After these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. So Ellen White is saying, because he's reading Spirit of Prophecy here, um, that Revelation 18, which she marks as marking the Sunday law, is, is going to be recognized or seen when the work of the Holy Spirit has been accomplished in the heart of the individual. So we know that Revelation 18 is a historical event that occurs. It's a prophetic event. Alan White connects it to the Sunday Law. We connect it to 9-11, really the beginning of the Sunday Law. And from that, that message of this other angel empowers the third angel 
And we know righteousness by faith is the third angel's message in verity, which has to do with its, with in reality that is worked out in the life. Now, Jones is taking this verse and he's saying that this is Revelation 18 and this is happening now in his time in 1893. But we know that for, that for that angel to come down, and we talked about this first, is that many Adventists think the Sunday law is just going to come and then I'm going to get ready for it. Or I'll be ready for it just because I know what the Sunday law issue is about. So I can live my life the way I want to right now. But I've made the argument that in order for prophetic events to occur, God's people have to be fulfilling their role. If William Miller does not give the message that Christ is coming in 1843. If people don't accept that message, if we don't have the Millerite movement, does Christ just begin his work in the heavenly place, in, in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary on October 22nd, 1844, when no one is aware of it? Excuse me, please. The yeah. Door. yeah. I, I could use a white don't know about second coming of God. It is uh, I just said my mom said to me, Father, uh, Lord of Himself, a white saying, He don't know when is God coming back second time. Mom just said. Lord of his son, his son, they told him his only father, he knows when his son coming back in this second time. As though I know that, white make wrong on that his status, he wouldn't, he don't know what he is saying coming about Christ, Father knows when his son coming back in this of the second time. He made that stake good in his studies. Okay. So um, I'm not really sure what you're saying, but uh, when we look at this statement here, what, what has to happen in order for um, the mighty, the, this uh, other angel to come down from heaven? What has to happen for Revelation 18 uh, to be fulfilled? Um. So I repeat this again. I I repeat this again. I just said, white don't know. He, white don't know. He's not what in the this day. Well, uh, Christ coming second time. His son told his. Only father know when his son coming back second time, he was wrong in his study. Okay. Okay, so Ellen White says here, um, day after day is passing into eternity, bringing us nearer to the close of probation. Now we must pray as never before for the Holy Spirit to be more abundantly bestowed upon us. And we must look for its sanctifying influence to come upon the workers, that the people for whom they may, for whom they labor may know that they have been with Jesus and learned of him. We need spiritual eyesight now as never before, that we may see afar off, and that we may discern the snares and designs of the enemy, and as faithful watchmen proclaim the danger. We need spiritual power that we may take in 
as far as the human mind can, the great subjects of Christianity and how far reaching are its principles. When God's people humble the soul before him, individually seeking his Holy Spirit with all the heart, there will be heard from human lips such a testimony as is represented in this scripture. After these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. There will be faces aglow with the love of God. There will be lips touched with holy fire, saying, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Those who are under the influence of the Spirit of God will not be fanatical, but calm, steadfast, free from extravagance. But let all who have had the light of truth shining clear and distinct upon their pathway be careful how they cry peace and safety. Be careful what influence you exert at this time. When the Holy Spirit was poured out upon the early church, the whole multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. The Spirit of Christ made them one. This is the fruit of abiding in Christ. So when we look at what Jones is saying here, he's, um, I just read more of the context of Ellen White's statement. Um, what is it that Jones sees? I mean, we can all recognize we need to humble our soul before God. We need to do an individual work. But and he's just been saying that this this scripture has been fulfilled. We have Revelation 18 is now being fulfilled. But he quotes this quote from Spirit of Prophecy. So what is Jones noting? Think of the Lord's Prayer. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Can, a might, can this angel come down from heaven unless there is a work that's being done first in the individual heart? No. Can it, right? So when we look at history, when we look at what happened in the past, we know that the message of Miller had to happen in order for Christ to begin his work in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. We know that a work had to happen before 9-11. 9-11 couldn't have happened as a prophetic event unless first we were already repeating Millerite history, that there was a movement that was repeating Millerite history. That means even before November 9th, 1989, we had to have had... Um, this work uh, going on um, on this earth in the understanding of prophecy. Because if you're going to have a prophetic event, you need people to be able to recognize that. And there has to then be a, a messenger chosen to give a message, to give an increase of light. So that's the thing that we often fail to understand is the connection of this message to prophetic events. So when people rejected July 18th and wanted to just present the third angel's message or something of that nature, they were asking for an impossibility. Because you can't give the third angel's message if it's not connected to prophecy. You just can't do it. You can say all the right words, but it's not going to happen. The message is not going to be given. It's not going to be understood. It's not going to be received. It's not going to accomplish its work. It has to be tied to prophecy. And, and one of the things we see here is we see that we can take these events of the past and see that they're prophetic events. Even though Jones is wrong about what's going to happen immediately, 
he is correct. And Ellen White bears witness of that, that there is an understanding of this message that is occurring, a work that is beginning. It's not going to ultimately be accomplished. And because it's not ultimately accomplished, we can't have the Sunday law that Jones wants to see. Because right? he wants to see this work end, not that he wants to see a Sunday law and see persecution. But he says, we've, it's already been done. It's just going to happen. Okay, I have a question. Okay. <clears throat> Did Moses experience righteousness by faith? Yes. Okay. So Moses experienced it and he understood what it meant for the need for the children of Israel to become righteous by their faith in Christ. Mm -hmm. Now, and, and when you, you bring up Moses experiencing righteousness by faith, now, we all know the Hebrews chapter 11, the faith chapter, right? But when we look at the things that mark righteousness by faith, we often don't really consider what's being explained there. Agreed. Because Moses, he experienced righteousness by faith. On what basis? According to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 24 and 25 and 26 and 27 and 28. And there's lots of things. He, he had all of these things that are show an example of righteousness by faith. But the first one is that he refused to become the, be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Right. Right. He, he wanted to, he rather suffer affliction with the people of God than enjoy the pleasure of sins for sin for a season. He esteemed the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. So he understood we know where his heart was. He was converted. He understood what was valuable. And that was God's kingdom, righteousness. He was interested in righteousness, not in things, not in power, not in riches. And so by faith, he forsook Egypt not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. And through faith, he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith, he passed through the Red Sea. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down. Right now, of course, that's not basically um, here we're going from Moses and we're starting to go into the children of Israel. But Moses is a part of crossing the Red Sea. He's not going to be part of the falling down of the walls of Jericho. But he is in a sense. Right? Because Moses had faith, Joshua was able to have faith. And because Joshua could have faith, Rahab the harlot could have faith. And if we look at this, this is really a chain of faith. These, this is... The prophetic chain, if we go to Hebrews chapter 11 and read through it, is it not? <clears throat> Would we agree with that? Would we disagree with that, I think, is a bigger question. Because we'd have to agree with it. Yeah, we would, we would see that this is the prophetic chain. These are all of these reform lines that we've been studying, you know, going through gradually um, in the morning studies. Right? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> so
So we go back to Jones here. I just have to get back to it. Hang on a sec for some reason. Oh, there we go. <clears throat> so we know that we have to humble our, 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 our souls individually. Now he says, I read the other one, which connects directly to this. Jesus longs to bestow the heavenly endowment in large measure upon his people. Prayers are ascending to God daily for the fulfillment of the promise. And not one of the prayers put up in faith is lost. And Joan says, prayers are ascending daily for it. Are your prayers amongst them? Christ ascended on high, leading captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. When after Christ's ascension, the spirit came down as promised, like a rushing mighty wind, filling the whole place where the disciples were assembled. What was the effect? Thousands were converted in a day. We have taught, we have expected that an angel is to come down from heaven and that the earth will be lightened with his glory. Then we shall behold an ingathering of souls similar to that witnessed on the day of Pentecost. So again, this is Ellen White saying that God wants to bestow this heavenly endowment upon his people, right? Because we want to see this earth lightened with his glory. But this angel comes bearing no soft, smooth message, but words calculated to stir the hearts of men to the very depths. That angel is represented as crying mightily with a strong voice saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and is become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins and that ye receive not of her plagues. We are indeed as human agencies to cooperate with the divine instrumentalities in sounding the message of this mighty angel who is to lighten the earth with his glory. Um, are we indeed, it's actually a question, are we indeed as human agencies to cooperate? Of course, that would be a rhetorical question. Where are we? In the loud cry of the third angel's message. That angel's message is to go to call God's people out of Babylon, but the angel comes down having great power then we are not brought face to face with the demand for that power, that we must have to be clothed with power, then are we not brought face to face with the demand for that power, that we must be clothed with power from on high, the power that is brought by God's Holy Spirit? Are we not there? The audience, yes. Well then, brethren, let us stay there. Let us stay there, calling for that power and depending wholly upon it when it comes. So here, Jones is seeing that this mighty angel of Revelation 18, in his view, has come down. And Ellen White says that when it comes down, uh, this is the work of the Holy Spirit that has to occur. Now, we're just going to go into Jones' next message. Um, and, and this is typical Jones here. Um, I find that some are beginning to get a little perplexed by not doing what we agreed to the first night, or else they did not get here in time to agree to that. The first night, you know, we agreed to stand by the text of Scripture and say it is so, that if any man thinketh he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing yet as he ought to know. Some have perhaps come in since these lessons began, and others who have not remembered fully to stick to the text have begun to say like this, well, now, all these things are plain that you have set forth, but I do not see how they are going to fit such and such things that we have held before. And don't be a bit afraid if these things are plain and they say they are. Then look at them. If they are new, don't try to put a new wine into old bottles. To all such who may think these things are new, I say, do not try to put new wine into old bottles. You cannot do that. Do not get concerned about what you thought before. I'm not talking at random on these things at all. I know what I am saying, and I know some other things that are coming besides. If you have been thinking right before, this will fit. And if you have not been thinking right, it ought not to fit. Let us study these things together. Have I brought any matters before you that are not actual facts? 
the audience says no. All we are studying this week is that one text we started with. Many other things are going to come that we have not yet taken a text for, but we are studying this, this week, this text, the people who will now see what is soon to come upon us by what is being transacted before us will no longer trust in human inventions and will feel that the Holy Spirit must be recognized, received, presented before the people. Now, so going back to what Jones had talked about before, and we looked at um, what he was quoting from, the, the Spirit of Prophecy uh, presentation that Ellen White did that he was quoting from. And when we talk about the Holy Spirit needing to be recognized, received, and presented, we know that there is a counterfeit of that. And uh, one such counterfeit is um, uh, the book by um, Prescott, The Coming of the Comforter. No, by, um, not by Prescott, by Froome, The Coming right. of the Comforter. Yeah. So Froome writes this book, The Coming of the Comforter. That is not an Adventist book presenting an evangelical understanding of the Holy Spirit. So when we talk about the Holy Spirit must be recognized, received, and presented, for many Adventists today, it's going to mean something quite different than it would mean to A.T. Jones or to Ellen White or to Adventists at that time. Now, what do we mean the Holy Spirit must be recognized, received, and presented? How do we recognize the Holy Spirit? What do they mean by recognizing the Holy Spirit? Would it be connected to your present truth message? Okay. So, so if we have a message, that is, we need to recognize light that's coming to us, and we have to recognize that this light is coming from the Holy Spirit, what's one way we know that it's the Holy Spirit that's giving us light? It is uh, based on past light. Okay, so it's based on past light. That's true. So the Holy Spirit's never going to contradict itself. But isn't the work of the Holy Spirit to convince of sin, righteousness, and judgment? Yes. Yeah. So if a message comes to you and it's not convicting you, it's not causing confession and repentance. It might have some truth to it, but it's not coming to you through the Holy Spirit. If it's making you think of yourself more highly than you ought, then it's not coming from the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes, it's going to give you a message that brings conviction. Conviction of sin. And then when the Holy Spirit does that, it's going to be received. What does it mean to receive the Holy Spirit? That we're accepting what we're being taught. Yeah. So if we take those three steps, steps to convince the world of sin, of righteousness, receiving the Holy Spirit produces righteousness in the person. Would we agree with that? Yes. Okay. And then, of course, judgment. Now, the next step here, instead of, you know, convicting of sin, righteousness, and judgment, it's recognized, received, and presented. But it's a message of judgment that has to be given. Right? So when the Holy Spirit is recognized and received, the message that's being presented is what kind of message?
it can be considered as a very cutting message. Right. It's going to be a message of coming judgment. It's going to be a convicting message. It's going to be the work of the Holy Spirit that's being presented. It's not going to be a peace and safety message. And we know that for the most part, when we see the Holy Spirit being talked about, it's almost always in connection with the peace and safety message. Whether, whether we're talking about in the Adventist church or whether we're talking about in other churches. It's something that's going to give you power so that you can be successful, right? It's a message that's going to flatter human nature. So, so this can't be what's being talked about. But also notice here, by what is being transacted before us, we're by what we see being transacted before us, we will now see what will soon come upon us. And, and because of that, we no longer trust in human inventions. And what are human inventions that people trust in that are contrary to the Holy Spirit? Immortality of the soul and Sunday sacredness. Okay, so they can be doctrines, right? So they can be false doctrines that people trust in. And there can be all kinds of them that are really, you know, do it thou wilt type of ideas, peace and safety messages. But also human inventions can be all of those types of teachings and machinery that help us just depend upon on man instead of upon God. That is, they have us focus upon the power of man rather than the power of God. So they can be church membership, right? They can be church organization. And, and these, these can be human inventions now, the idea of an invention, I mean, what's an invention? The creation of man. Okay. It's in a creation of man. But why, why does, I mean, she uses this word human inventions. I mean, um, we think of inventions as, as things that are invented, you know, like the television and, and the wheel, stuff like that, right? Does inventions mean anything else? Think of other words that are related to it. What, what is a convention? Outside of those that are getting together, I, I mean, there's several meanings for that. Well, uh, well, a convention is, is something that's just um, <clears throat> like a tradition, right? Now, now, here's what Webster says about the word invention. The action or operation of finding out something new, the contrivance of that which did not exist before, as an invention of logarithms, the invention of art, printing, the invention of orrery. Invention differs from discovery. Invention is applied to the contrivance and production of something that did not before exist. Discovery brings to light that which existed before, but which was not, net, not known. We are indebted to invention for the thermometer and the barometer. We are indebted to the discovery for the knowledge of the Isles and the Pacific Ocean and for the knowledge of galvanism. The many species of earth not, formal, uh, not formally known. This distinction is important, though not always observed. Um, now, invention also can mean forgery or fiction. Fables are the inventions of ingenious men. Inventions also can refer to the finding and selecting of arguments to prove and illustrate a point of view. 
right? So, so when we look at Ellen White talk, trusting in human inventions, I mean, we can see definitely that doctrines are there, but it's also new fanciful ideas, right? All right. How do we trust in human inventions? What, what is she talking about trusting in human inventions then? These are both conventions, traditions, but also new ideas. I mean, would we put conspiracy theories in this class? Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and we can see that when people trust in these types of speculative ideas, these new ways of thinking, that it's actually contrary to the Holy Spirit. And in order for us to not trust in human inventions, we need the work of the Holy Spirit. That is, the Holy Spirit must be recognized, received, and presented. <clears throat> so Joan says, now, so far as we have got along pretty well and seen what is being transacted before us, talking about the World's Fair and the Sunday laws and all those things, and some of the things that are soon to come upon us, let us take what we have and make the most of it, and the rest will take care of itself when it comes. Now, tonight, I'm not going to take up another study right in the same line of what is being transacted before us. I will simply call attention to facts, things that you can see and things that everybody in the world can see who reads the common daily events as they appear in the daily papers of the world. You can see them and everybody else can see them. Have we brought up anything in these lessons yet as to what is being transacted before us that everybody cannot see? The audience says no. As to what is coming upon us, we can tell them that they may not believe what is soon to come, of course, but they cannot help seeing what is before them. Now, the point here is, is Jones talking about things that are hidden? Or is he talking about things that can be seen? He's not talking about something that's happening in secret regarding the Sunday law and events. He's talking about things that anybody can see who reads the newspaper, correct? Okay, agreed. And everybody can see that they're happening. People aren't going to argue about whether these things are happening or not. They can all see it. Now he says, four years ago, last fall, I was appointed to write a reading for the week of prayer on our present standing and work. And in that, I mentioned some of the thoughts that I referred to the other night, but I call attention to this one particular thought now for our study tonight. Here it is. Under our constitution as it is, the total separation of church and state and the perfect religious liberty thereby assured have been a beacon light of progress to all other nations for 100 years. The American principle of the liberties and rights of men had an irresistible influence upon other nations in all parts of the earth. This is the genuine principle of Protestantism, which is, in short, the principle announced by Christ that men should render to Caesar only that which is Caesar's, and unto God that which is God. Against this principle, the papacy has constantly maintained that no state could exist without alliance with the church. In fact, that states exist only for the support and for the sake of the church, it is true that the American principle has not been adopted in its clearness by any other nation, but yet its influence has been untold in turning the minds of men from the influence of the papal theory. But just now, when the other nations in their perplexity are courting the support of Rome, the papacy takes advantage of this to reassert the papal theory and to claim that these things are an acknowledgement on the part of rulers and governors that her theory is correct. Now, in view of all this, and just at this time, in fact, this very year, 1888, so remember he's reading from what he had written in 1888. Here I mentioned the proposed constitutional amendment and the National Sunday Law Bill, which were then before the country as proposed by Senator Blair, in which Christianity as the religion of the nation and Sunday as the Sabbath were to be recognized and then continues can then continue as follows. When this is done, its influence in favor of the papacy will be 
inestimable, then it will be said that this nation, which was made such great pretensions to religious liberty, and which has been set forth as the model for earthly governments, has been compelled to reverse that which was supposed to be the enlightened order and to adopt the principles which the church has all the time maintained. Then as this nation has been the model of liberty, enlightenment, and progress to all others, so when its principles shall have been reversed, when the liberties and rights of men are denied, when the nation is carried back to the principle of the papacy in the dark ages, and persecution for conscience sake is carried on, the reaction upon other nations will be such as will infinitely uh, confirm and magnify the claims and power of the papacy. And so will be fulfilled the scripture. All that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life. In this way, uh, power will again be given to the papacy to make war with the saints of God, even as the scripture shows. The same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them until the ancient of days came and judgment was given to the saints of the most high and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. Daniel 7, 21 and 22. I had not then found this passage, which I shall now read from Schaeff's Church and State. Dr. Philip Schaeff, having been in Europe, being a born European himself and not coming to this country until he was a man full grown, being a graduate of of European universities and understanding European affairs better than any other person in the United States, and then coming over here and understanding the affairs of the United States to a considerable extent, writes thus in his Church and State in the United States, page 83. In conclusion, we must briefly survey the influence of the American system upon foreign countries and churches. Within the present generation, the principle of religious liberty and equality with the corresponding relaxation of the bond of union of church and state, has made steady and irresistible progress among the leading nations of Europe and has been embodied more or less clearly in written constitutions. The successful working of the principle of religious freedom in the United States has stimulated this progress without any official interference. All advocates of the voluntary principle in the support of churches and religion and of a separation of church and state in Europe, point to the example of this country as their strongest practical argument. Um, Elder Lewis Johnson, we know that it is so in Scandinavia. So this is somebody in the audience saying this. And Joan says, yes, it is known in all Europe. But what we want to know is that it is so in this country, that that is the influence our country has borne hitherto. And this, in order to see what its influence will be now that it is turned about and is going the other way. Here, Dr. Schaaf's argument as to the principles of the papacy in connection with the German empire in 1871. Uh, the Westphalia Treaty of 1648 confirmed the equal rights of the two contending churches, but the Pope never consented to even this limited toleration and will always protest against it. The papal syllabus of 1864 condemns religious toleration among the 80 heresies of the age. The Roman church acknowledges no other church and cannot do, do it consistently. She knows no geographical and national boundaries and rallies around the common center of the Vatican vice gerent of God on earth. She must submit, of course, to hard necessity, but does it under protest. So you see, according to that, the principles of the papacy are directly opposed to the principles of the United States Constitution. I will read a few passages further concerning the papal principles. I read from a book by Gladstone and Schaeff entitled Rome and the Newest Fashions in Religion, page 113. It is declared to be an error and condemned as such by the Pope to say that every man is free to embrace and profess the religion he shall believe true guided by the light of reason. That is an error condemned by the Church of Rome, but that is the doctrine of the government of the United States. That is the doctrine of the Constitution of the United States. Another error condemned by Rome is to say that the Church has not the power of availing herself of force or any direct or indirect temporal power. And that's from page 115. 
John says that is an error condemned by the Catholic Church, but that is the doctrine of the Constitution of the United States. It is a fundamental principle of the government of the United States that the churches shall have nothing to do with the affairs of the government. Another error condemned by the papacy is to say that the church ought to be separated from the state and the state from the church. That's from page 123. All these are condemned as errors by the Catholic Church, but all these express the very doctrine of the Constitution of the United States as its makers established it and intended it to be. And nothing could show more plainly how directly antagonistic are the principles of the papacy and the principles of the Constitution of the United States government. There's another word I will read. It is the statement of Leo XIII in 1891 as to what the authority of the church is, what her right is. It's page 868 of the Two Republics. So that's uh, a book that Jones wrote. He is writing to all the world about the condition of labor and the difficulties between labor and capital, governments and working men, et cetera, and says, it is the church that proclaims from the gospel those teachings by which the conflict can be put to an end to, or at least made far less bitter. The church uses its efforts not only to enlighten the mind, but to direct by its precepts the life and conduct of man and acts on the decided view that for these purposes, recourse should be had in due measure and degree to the help of the law and the state authority. And that is the very doctrine of the papal church officially set forth and as it, as in every other, in direct antagonism to the doctrine of the Constitution of the United States, as it reads, and as it was intended to be, not as it has been made to mean by the Supreme Court of the United States on February 29th, 1892. And that how that is how it that is how is it is that the influence which this government has had upon the other nations has been to carry them away from the doctrine of the papacy. And as Dr. Schaaf says, this influence has been steady and irresistible. Well, now, in the Supreme Court decision, February 29th, 1892, and in the legislation of Congress, recognizing and establishing Sunday as the Christian Sabbath, the government of the United States has reversed that order. The Constitution has been disregarded and overridden entirely. The government of the United States stands tonight in the hands of the hier a hierarchy here, which, in order to accomplish its purpose, joined hands with the papacy specifically. Well, now as to the influence that this will have upon their nations, let me read from that testimony that is now in number one of the bulletin, top of page 16. It touches this question that is before us tonight, and the Lord tells what is the consequence of this reversal of the original order of things in this government? As America, the land of religious liberty, shall unite with the papacy in forcing the consciences of men to honor the false Sabbath, the people of every country on the globe will be led to follow her example. Now, now Jones brings up a point here. So he's, he's talking about nations, the United States of America, its constitution. And if Americans follow the Constitution, they're an influence for good around the world. That is, that Constitution, as it's lived out, bears testimony to the power of the gospel. Correct? Yes. Yeah. Because the American Constitution is an expression of the gospel. It's a Protestant principle. And you know that there will be those that will disagree with you. Okay. Now, one of the things that the Omega did is that they tried to argue that America was not a Christian nation. Because we didn't, and, and that to call it a Christian nation was a repudiation of the Constitution. I don't know if people remember what was being said. I remember disagreeing with it. Yeah. And, and they were trying to argue that, um, well, a number of different things, but in connection with their liberal ideas, 
that true liberty meant that we needed to accept um, homosexuals and transgendered people. That, that was the principle of the Constitution, that we couldn't call it sin. Correct? Yeah, because I turned my stomach. Yeah. So we know that this is a, a misapplication of the principles of religious liberty. All men are created equal. All men have a right to act in a certain way. Now, Jones deals with this, this, these ideas of what, what's the difference between morality and civility. And we'll get into that in some of his other studies. Um, and, and, and he addressed it in 1888 with the Blair Bill. That is, uh, the state cannot judge the heart. It cannot judge morality, but it can talk about civility. That is how people should act. There is such a thing as a crime, right? Now, crimes might have uh, an underlying basis in the moral code of the Ten Commandments. But as far as the state is concerned, it can't know, it can't care about the thoughts and intents of the heart. It can only address the actions, whether they're civil or uncivil. Whether something's legal or illegal. And things can be illegal that, that are attached to morality. Right? So when we say thou shalt not kill or thou shalt not commit murder, the state can also have laws against murder, but it's not addressing the heart. It can't decide how that person felt when they killed or whether they're repentant. Now, when we deal with in the court with um, victim impact statements or we have to have a criminal uh, gets a lesser sentence because he appears to have remorse. What is the state doing? What is the court system doing when it addresses things like victim impact statements or um, remorse on the part of somebody who commits a crime? What are they doing? Are they blurring the line between civility and morality? Absolutely. They're obscuring those lines, yes. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. what is justice? We have the, the statue with the scales. And, and what is justice supposed to be? The crime meets the punishment, or the punishment meets the crime. No? Isn't justice blind? It's supposed to be. Yeah, so what does that mean that justice is blind? It's not to regard any by race, gender, or color of their skin. Yeah, and, and it means even more than that. That is, justice is um, has no compassion or mercy attached to it. That is, it doesn't consider the personal situation of a person. All it can consider is what is the law and was the law broken, right? But that distinction has disappeared a long time ago. Hmm. So to get back on, on track here, when we look at America, the land of religious liberty, it has this influence. And it's going to have an influence for good or for bad. The 
He says, how far then, brethren, is the influence of this nation to go now that it is turned about? To every nation on the globe, what did the turning about of this nation do that made, that made the image of the beast? Well, then, as in view of that fact, other lessons that we have had bring us face to face with the giving of that message in its express words and terms. How far is that message to go? To every nation and kindred and tongue and people. Then is this nation, having turned about, will lead every nation on the globe in the wrong way back to the principles of the papacy, in fact. So it is time for the third angel's message to reach every nation on the globe. That is the message now. Well, then are we ready to go? The, that being the message that is to go, does it not become every professor of that message to hold himself in readiness to go to the ends of the earth when God calls him to go? The influence of this is to lead every nation on the globe back to the papacy. The work of the third angel's message is to warn all nations of the earth against the worship of the papacy and this image of it, which brings us back to the papacy. Just as certainly as that influence reaches every nation on the globe, so certainly this warning must go to every nation on the globe. Then every man is unfaithful to the trust which God has given us in the third angel's message. If he holds himself back from the call of God to go anywhere on the globe, isn't he? then that brings us again face to face with such a consecration as there has never been among Seventh-day Adventists. It brings us face to face with such a consecration that home, family, property, everything is surrendered into the hands of God to let him call us and send us or such means as we have where he pleases and do what he chooses with us. Are we ready? Isn't it time to get ready? Um, Elder C.L. Board says, yes, all are ready, Brother Jones. Elder Jones, good. But that is the thing we are to think of. I was constrained to say today to one brother while talking with him that these things as they stand now make a greater strain upon real actual faith than we have ever had yet. For it is just to stand face to face with ourselves and tell ourselves and set it down as a convincing actual fact that the seven last plagues are going to come pretty soon and that we are working in view of that fact and that the coming of the Lord follows the seven last plagues in view of that, in view of which we are working. And the coming of the Lord is the end of the world. And for me to face myself and talk to myself like that, I tell you, it draws on a man. I find that it draws on me. Well, all I can say, brethren, is let it draw. I can't dodge it. I wouldn't if I could. I would not go back on it if I could. But it draws on the very vitals of a man's faith. That is a fact. Well, brethren, let it draw until it draws us completely out of self and into Jesus Christ holy. As America, the land of religious liberty, shall unite with the papacy in forcing the consciences of men to honor the false Sabbath, the people of every country on the globe will be led to follow her example. Our people are not half awake to do all in their power with the facilities within their reach to extend the message of warning to the world. New churches must be built, new congregations organized. Let the light shine to all lands and at all peoples. Now, when we look at this and we start to compare what Jones is talking about with our present situation, our movement professes to have a message to warn first the Adventist church and then the world about what's coming. Has this, is this movement prepared to do that? Not yet. No. And, and you can see, even in 1893, as Jones talks about this, he's looking at warning the world at a time when the church has, you know, 30,000 members. Something like that. <coughs> I can't remember the exact number, but somewhere around there. Maybe it's, it's, it's more, but... It's at a time when the church is definitely not a worldwide organization. And yet they have to warn the world. And so the movement is just as unprepared now, maybe even more so <clears throat> than the Adventist church was in 1893 to do its work. But what does it take for us to be able to do that work? It first takes the work of the Holy Spirit. 
you know, if this movement was to decide, oh, we need to, we need to give a message to the Levites. And we, we just got together one day and we decided that we were going to work in a particular way, um, whatever that would be. And we, we started to work in that way, but we're unconverted still. Would that work amount to anything, even if we could organize ourselves to do it? No. No, no it wouldn't amount to anything. And, and we, we see those types of things happening. Ministries organize, and they do a work. They publish tracts, they publish books, they have websites, they have videos. But the work still isn't done because we're unconverted. We're not necessarily giving the correct message. We might be giving part of the truth, but it's not the message for the time. But the thing is, we haven't, we're not even in the point where we could even organize and work together to accomplish anything. But we can't put the cart before the horse. We know that the first work that needs to be done is a work of confession and repentance. Now, Jones uses an example from, from his time. He says, I hope Brother Robinson will get all that he called for to build up the work in London. And I hope Sister White will get all she calls for to build that church in Australia. And Brother Chadwick get all he calls for. And everybody else get all they called for. How long will our property be good for anything anyhow? And when the seven last plagues are soon to fall, what will it be worth? What good is it going to do when the seven last plagues fall? What is the good of it? But there's the point. When we come to save from real conviction and stand face to face with the fact as a fact that the seven last plagues are indeed soon coming and that the Lord is coming right at the end of that, it is going to draw on the very vitals of our faith. It is going to bring out what is in us. If a person has real confidence in the message, this is going to reveal it. And there will be plenty of means. I'm not a bit uneasy about the means. If Seventh-day Adventists who have means do not consecrate themselves to the Lord and let him have their means, the Lord will get means somewhere else. He will call up other people. Brethren, it is the worst thing that can happen to a Seventh-day Adventist who has means when God has to pass him by and find somebody else that will give what is wanted. A Seventh-day Adventist left to himself is the worst off man in this world. We have come to a place where God wants us to use all we have. And when we believe this, our means and ourselves will be for his use. And his work will soon be done. And then we shall not need any more means. That is the situation now. This government, as it was, drew the nations in its train away from the papacy. And this government, as it is, draws all in its train back to the papacy. And the papacy knows it. And knowing it, she is working for that very thing now and has her, I was going to say her fingers, but no, she has got her whole arms in it and is beginning to wield the government in her own interests. All that Protestantism is today in the United States and all that these churches are, that they have worked for the Sunday law, is merely a tool in the hands of the papacy. And how many of you have seen a Punch and Judy show? Many of the audience held up their hands. Those little figures that work back and forth there, bobbing up and down to and from above the curtain, are manipulated by someone behind the curtain. So I think he's talking about uh, puppets. You don't see him. See him. Those little puppets that bob up there are exactly what those, these Protestant churches are today in the hands of the papacy. She is beneath. She sits behind the curtain. She works the wires. She touches the triggers. These Protestants, in their blindness, think they are doing great things for themselves, but they are simply the puppets in the hand of the papacy, working as she desires upon this government and through this government for all the world. And it is time to tell them so. But when the message goes that tells them so, it tells them that Babylon is fallen and that they must come out of her. And if they would escape the plagues and when they are called out of her, where can they go? All the world is under the control of the papacy, except the third angel's message, thank the Lord. All the world is under the control of the papacy and its principles. But when they are called out of it, where alone can they go to the third angel's message as God gave it? <clears throat> so, brethren, we are in the grandest time this world ever saw. Oh, that we may consecrate ourselves to God as becomes 
towards us. We're living in this grandest of times. And of course, we can say this uh, today. I shall read you at another time a statement from volume four, how this great number of ministers will turn to the truth of the third angel's message under the loud cry. Many of the ministers who now think that this Sunday law work and all this is all right, they do not see what is under it. When the papacy begins to move a little more openly, they will back out of the whole thing. They will cut loose from that thing. But where can they go to the third angel's message? Thank the Lord. I tell you, brethren, the power of God is going to do something right away. Oh, that we may surrender all things to him, that he may. Now, um, we know that this is uh, the joining of the two sticks. He d Jones doesn't call it this, but that's what we understand, is that as we approach the Sunday law, that those who have understood the spirit of the papacy begin to see where things are tending. And they're going to stand with God's people at the end. Uh, Jones says, let me read here the aims of the papacy as set forth in her own words. This is from the New York Sun of July 11, 1892. And if there is an official Catholic paper in the United States, it is the New York Sun. Don't forget that. Not that the Sun is run professedly as a Catholic paper, but it is that. And the Sun has a correspondent in Rome in the Vatican, a priest. I don't know what his name is. He doesn't sign his name, but writes under the nom de plume, under a nom de plume. And you can bear in mind that dispatches to the Sun from Rome are always straight. So I say that the Sun is virtually more representative of the papacy of the Catholic Church in this country than most of the Catholic organs even unless perhaps Cardinal Gibbons' organ. Uh, this was the letter written directly by the Sun correspondent from Rome last summer. So I read it here. It is entitled, The Papacy and Nationality, Pope Leo and the United States. After speaking of certain classes in the Catholic Church, bishops, archbishops, etc., and as to their aims in the United States, it says, but Leo XIII has a still higher aim, his appeal for national unification is founded upon a traditional conception of the Holy See. In his view, the United States have reached the period when it becomes necessary to bring about the fusion of all the heterogeneous elements into one homogeneous and indissolvable nation. Statements are preoccupied, statesmen are preoccupied, and very properly with the multiplicity of centrifugal forces which threaten the Republic with disintegration. Enemies make use of this latent danger to accuse the foreign Catholics of having a tendency to form a state within the state. It is for this reason that the Pope wants the Catholics to prove themselves the most enlightened and most devoted workers for national unity and political assimilation. Certain incidents have given a bad color to the loyalty of some foreign groups. All doubt upon this subject ought to disappear. The church has always been the able collaborator of all people in the work of national unity. It was she that constituted through the efforts of popes and bishops, the great political bodies and the great national organizations. The most united races and the most solid populations politically and nationally are those who have most profoundly felt the salutary action of the papacy and the church. France is the typical example of this law of history. If Italy in the middle ages did not take advantage of this incomparable benefit, was it not because the jealous states interfered with the work of unification of the church and of the Roman pontiffs? America feels the urgent need of this work and of internal fusion formed of a mosaic of races and nationalities. She wants to be a nation, a collective being, one strong and united. What the church has done in the past for others, she will do for the United States. That is the reason why the Holy See encourages the American clergy to guard jealously the solidarity, uh, and to labor for the fusion of all the foreign and heterogeneous elements in one vast national family. The American church furnishes and must furnish at the present time the proof that Christianity is the school of patriotism and of national sentiment. By continuing to favor the work of unification, it will form the grandeur of the United States and will demonstrate the degree to which religion and the church are the generators of political patriotic and patriotic independence. As the approaching danger to the United States lies in fractionizing the Republic into centrifugal 
and hostile parties, the Catholics will appear through their cooperation in national concentration, the best sons of the land and the upholders of political unity. The Pope will impose upon all the American, upon all the American motto, E Pluribus Unum, applied to the subject we are treating. Finally, Leo XIII desires to see strength in that unity. Like all intuitive souls, he hails in the United American States and in their young and flourishing church, the source of a new life for Europeans. He wants America to be powerful in order that Europe may gain, regain strength from borrowing a, rejuvenate, a rejuvenated type. So what is this um, uh, Catholic writer saying? What is he asking Catholics to do? to work within the laws of America to support the Pope. Okay, now, and to bring about a, a more centralization of American, American um, politics. Yes. Right? You know, out of one many, right? So the idea is that, um, uh, America becomes this strong nation and that these individualistic elements within the United States are suppressed. Do we see that action happening in, in the U.S. at the present time? That's what, that is what some would have you believe. That we're trying to that you see powers trying to unite the states so that the that the federal government has more power. Yes. Yeah. That, that's what the, that's what the Catholics want. They want a strong central government. So people that don't go along with that are seen to be terrorists, right? Exactly. It's, it's anti-individualism. So now how does this relate to our present situation? Because our time's up here, but how does this relate to the idea of organization or the type of order that God wants to have? When, when FFA set up the, I can't remember what it was called, the, it's, they're basically their Biblical Research Institute, um, Doctrinal Analysis Group. What were they doing? Centralizing study. Okay. Sounds good though, doesn't it? No. <laughs> well, why did they do it if it doesn't sound good? Because the type of mistake that has been used and followed many times in the past. Yeah. So, so we know that uh, their intention was, and I'm not really sure, because my understanding of the doctrinal analysis group uh, when it was first set up was just that when we're going to be publishing articles, uh, we would want people to look them over and bring out any sort of um, suggestions, right? So I was part of the doctrinal analysis group. So I'm supposed to be reading these articles they would send me and... You know, and I wasn't really sure, you know, what do we do? Give it a thumbs up, you know? Um, I, I tried to deal more with, you know, the way the style of writing, not so much the content. 
um, of papers that were as asked to read. But um, Tabo, one of his arguments was that I couldn't publish anything on Facebook that first didn't go through the doctrinal analysis group. So what was he doing? Seeking to silence you. you. Yeah, but, but you can see that the idea that somehow if I'm gonna share with people on Facebook, if I'm gonna write a short article on something, that I have to get approval by the church, isn't this even worse than what the church required of us in regard to the 2520? It was an amplification of that. Yeah. See, what always happens when, um, and I've seen this happen in other situations, we look at the Catholic Church and we start to model ourselves after the Catholic Church and our excuse is, well, the problem with the Catholic Church is they just were wrong doctrinally, but they weren't wrong in principle in how they were acting. Um, I remember we had... Uh, can't remember what his position was in the church. I don't think he was the ministerial director, but he was something like that from the Alberta conference. And he came to our house for Sabbath dinner. He was a young guy. He'd never had a job in his life. He went from, from high school to university to uh, uh, being uh, on um, the conference committee for Alberta conference. And uh, I remember my son, Joe, who would have been about 14 at the time, maybe 15. Uh, my kids always engaged in any visitors that came over, even when they're little kids. But, um, you know, we we're having a discussion. And, and this fellow said that the Catholic Church was not wrong in persecuting Protestants. There was nothing wrong with their control that they tried to exercise. The only problem was that they were doctrinally at fault. And you didn't toss the guy out on his ear? Well, we pretty much did. <laughs> um, we definitely opposed him. But it was my son, Joe, who was the most appalled. Uh, he just could not believe that there was somebody in the Alberta Conference who could say such a thing, let alone think such a thing. Um, so, you know, we talked about it quite a bit afterwards. But yeah, so this, this was the situation that we have. And, but we have the same spirit of the papacy always being exercised. Now, the thing is, there's always extremes. Because, you know, Jones is going to write a paper called um, An Appeal for Evangelical Christianity. Um, and in there, I mean, he's going to talk about the papal attitude of the church. Right. And how the, the church is um, is in going in a wrong direction. And he's going to present that on March 27th, 1909 at the General Conference. Uh, that's this paper here. And uh, this paper here on, or pardon me, May 27th, 1909. And then on May 31st, Ellen White is going to, or May 30th, Ellen White's going to uh, present. She's going to present. And, and basically attack everything that Jones says. And, and we're going to look at that at some point here. We're not going to look at it right now. But, but the idea here that Jones is bringing out about this papal um, attitude of the United States, that it's heading in the direction of the papacy. Well, it's true of our movement as well. And the thing is, how do we solve this problem? Well, the solution is, is, is the work of the Holy Spirit upon the individual heart. There's not going to be any machinery that's going to bring about true order and true organization. And, and that was the problem that the movement made in 2017. Is we weren't seeking to get unity in the movement by being converted, by preaching the gospel. We thought that unity could be brought about by committees and um, doctrinal analysis groups. And that's not how it's going to come about. 
So any final thoughts on this before we close with prayer? Good presentation. Yeah. So the one thing I can say where we started this off with this connection of July 18th, with this symbol of July 18th squared, um, what we should be able to see from prophecy is that God is leading this movement and has been leading this movement. But we should also see that without prophecy, we're not going to be able to be prepared. And that this movement, if we're going to have confession and repentance, it's going to be the work of the Holy Spirit. But that work of the Holy Spirit is not disconnected from prophecy. That we need to be a part of the prophetic lines as they unfold. Okay. Well, let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so very thankful for the light that has come upon our path. And we know, Lord, that we have been unfaithful in the tasks that you have given us. We know, Lord, that um, your Holy Spirit is not recognized, received, or presented. We ask, Lord, that we can be representatives of yours, that we can reflect your character. We don't know how this work can be accomplished, Lord, on a worldwide scale, but we know that that work can be accomplished in our own hearts as we seek you. We pray for each person in this movement, for those seeking light and truth. We ask, Lord, that as we pass through these events of history before us, that we will clearly see where we stand. That we will see our need of you. And that you can unite us with Christ and with one another. This is our prayer in Jesus' name.